we're going to move on now to our second speaker, who is um, Dr. Edwin uh, Lyman. He's the Director of Nuclear Power Safety at the Union of Concerned Scientists in Washington, DC. He has published articles in journals, including Science, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Science and Global Security, and Arms Control Today. Dr. Lyman has also co-authored the book, Fukushima, the Story of a Nuclear Disaster. And he currently serves on a US National Academy of Sciences panel on the merits and viability of advanced reactors and fuel cycles. He earned a BA in physics from New York University in 1986 and a PhD in physics from Cornell in 1992. So Dr. Lyman, it's the floor is yours. So in the uh, US, we typically do not make a land acknowledgement, but um, given uh, the context here, I, I am in Washington, DC. And um, Washington, DC sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, the neighbors, the ancestral lands of the Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples. Now I'm going to um, talk about the problems with pyroprocessing which is the technology that Moltex is hyping in particular to produce its fuel. So Moltex has been championing this, um, this technology known as pyroprocessing, which it calls cheap, simple, efficient, clean, and proliferation resistant as a way to extract plutonium from or recycle can do spent fuel for use as fresh fuel in the Moltex reactor as uh, Ramana talked about just now. And if you listen to the company, you would think that they are, uh, that this is a well-established cheap and, and simple technology that will be able to uh, reuse or recycle spent fuel and solve the uh, Canadian spent fuel problem. But uh, I've been monitoring the only industrial scale pyroprocessing system in the world, which is here in the United States in Idaho, and it's been operating uh, for 25 years. And the experience with the system has not been a success, uh, to put it mildly. In fact, for more than two decades, the US Department of Energy has operated a facility at a much lower throughput, that is, the rate of processing is much lower and a much higher cost than it originally anticipated or promised Congress and the American people. And in addition, pyroprocessing as a form of spent fuel reprocessing extracts materials that are attractive for use in nuclear weapons and thus has high proliferation terrorism risks. Moltex contends that pyroprocessing is a, somehow has properties, which means it doesn't actually increase the risk of proliferation. These are arguments that, uh, ha that have been thoroughly debunked. Uh, the proponents of this technology for many decades have been making this argument, but US nuclear weapons laboratories have made clear that it simply is not true. And it's a little uh, discouraging to have to keep highlighting um, and the facts that have come out a long time ago but people continue to make the same misleading arguments over and over again. Just a word about can do spent fuel. Um, it's mostly uranium, and about only about 0.4 percent of the spent fuel is actually plutonium and other so-called transuranic elements. That is, elements that are heavier than plutonium and could potentially be used as fuel in the Moltex reactor. Uh, the remainder is uranium, and there are highly radioactive fission products. So Moltex, Moltex proposes to pyroprocess can do spent fuel to extract that very tiny amount of plutonium and uh, transuranic elements and some of the uranium for production of fuel for what it calls its stable salt reactor. But by my estimate, it would take around 750 tons of spent can-do fuel uh, to separate enough plutonium for a single 300 megawatt stable salt reactor. 
And again, only you know, less than half a percent of that material is plutonium. You would need about another half percent of the uranium from the can-do spent fuel, leaving over 99% or something like 740 tons of radioactive waste. So the notion that this process is going to effectively recycle nuclear waste is, is clearly uh, absurd. Here is a, a graph of the proposed or one of the proposed fuel compositions for the Multex reactor. And as Ramana pointed out, there, there are many different variants floating around in the small amount of public information about this plant. But you can see that it would um, have roughly the same weight of plutonium chloride and uranium chloride. Uh, the remainder would be potassium chloride. And there would be a small uh, quantity of fission products, mainly from the lanthanide group of the periodic table. And this is significant because lanthanides are elements that have chemical properties similar to plutonium. Um, and in this pyroprocessing process, some of them will get carried over with the product. Now we heard about the EBR2, which was the US uh, experiment with a metal fueled sodium cooled fast reactor that shut down in 1994 by the uh, Clinton administration, partly because it was inconsistent with that administration's nonproliferation policy. And shutting down the reactor left a substantial amount of irradiated fuel from the fast reactor. Some of it was had rather highly concentrated or highly enriched uranium. This is the fuel that is actually used to drive the nuclear reaction. And there's a relatively small amount of driver fuel. Most of the fuel was what was called blanket fuel. And this was originally a, a depleted uranium metal that as it was irradiated, a small amount of plutonium accumulated in it. And so it's really the blanket fuel that's most analogous to can do spent fuel um, because of the low uh, burn up and the uh, small amount of plutonium. So as uh, EBR was operating, the Department of Energy was very anxious to develop what they uh, closed fuel cycle and demonstrate reprocessing and recycling of the spent fuel. And they developed the so-called electro-refining process, which we call pyroprocessing. This is uh, really a, a fancy term for electroplating. In other words, you have a, a molten salt a bath where you stick a metal material uh, on a, an anode. So it's a, sort of like a battery or an electrochemical cell. Uh, that, that metal will dissolve into the salt depending on its properties, the properties of the different constituents, and then it will plate out on a cathode. And so in this way, you can actually dissolve the metal and plate out elements that you want and extract it. Um, and things that you don't want stay in the salt. And originally, the intention was to extract both uranium, uh, relatively pure uranium, on one cathode, and then extract plutonium and these other transuranics on another cathode. And here's an example or a diagram of that process. And the point here is just to show that it's really not uh, so simple. And actually, this is a pretty oversimplified process, uh, diagram of this very complex process. But what I want you to look at is all the different types of waste forms that are actually generated. And this is typical of, of reprocessing. So uh, spent nuclear fuel is a bad thing. Uh, it's a dangerous substance. But uh, when it comes out of a can-do reactor, it's essentially in a, in a solid form. And if it hasn't been damaged, it's a fairly robust uh, material. But what reprocessing does is it dissolves that material and it separates it out into various constituents and generates all sorts of different waste forms. And pyroprocessing is no exception. You have uh, the metal uh, cladding from the um, can-do fuel, which would go into, uh, which is, uh, somewhat radioactive and become one waste form. You would have the contaminated salt where a lot of the fission products end up. That would be another waste form. And then you have other materials that don't 
place so well in this process that would have to be treated separately. And then you have all that uranium left over, uh, which it turns out is not as clean as Moltex says it is. And in fact, that would be radioactive waste as well. And then you have the product that you want, uh, plutonium, other transuranics, and it's only uh, not waste if it's actually uh, used somewhere. So the EBR2 shutdown left about 26 tons of fuel, which the Department of Energy decided needed to be pyroprocessed because it claimed it could not be disposed of directly in the Yucca Mountain Repository, which was the U.S. Uh, facility for disposal of spent fuel, which has never actually been built. Uh, but because it, they claim the fuel is incompatible with that repository, they had to process it. And uh, about 22.4 uh, tons from the EBR2 was this blanket fuel material and a small amount of driver. But because of for proliferation reasons, um, DOE decided not to actually extract the plutonium from the spent fuel. It developed a modified flow sheet where we just extract the uranium and leave the plutonium and everything else in the salt, and that would become a waste form. So DOE ha hasn't actually demonstrated a process where you would separate out the plutonium on an industrial scale. And here's um, this revised process. So the process that Multex would use where the plutonium would be extracted hasn't even been demonstrated. Now, even though they simplified the process, it didn't work very well. And back in 2000, the Department of Energy uh, promised that they could use this process and they would uh, be able to get through the entire stockpile of that 26 tons of material in about eight years. That corresponds to a rate of an average rate of about um, uh, well, the, the average rate. Um, should be about three tons a year, right? So, um, um, but they ramped up. So the maximum rate they promised to achieve would be about five metric tons a year in their facility. But by 2007, it turned out that they weren't having much success at actually getting through that stockpile. And they were only, uh, and they, they changed their projection and said, we're actually going to only be able to do about one a little more than one ton a year, which would extend out the timeline for finishing the material by decades. But what actually happened today is that the, the rate was much smaller than even they projected in 2007, only a few hundred kilograms a year on average. So they're, they're much smaller. They, they've been able to process the material at a much lower rate than they ever imagined at the beginning and the process has not worked very well. And here's an, just an example of, of the early years process the best they could ever do was around um, less than 800 kilograms total in one year. And that uh, never got back to that. So, um, so it was really 30 times slower than the initial projection. And the cost also ballooned. So the original cost they projected, and these are US dollars, was about you know, less than $18,000 a kilogram for pyroprocessing the spent fuel from uh, the EBR2. But the actual cost uh, on average uh, to 2020 is worked out to around 50,000 US dollars per kilogram. And in the last few years, it's been a lot more than that, around $80,000 per kilogram. So if you think about that 750 tons of candid fuel that uh, I think would be needed to produce that first core for a 300 megawatt reactor, um, and they can't do it better than what DOE has done historically, that would be around $40 billion. But even if they do a lot better, the bill for that fuel is still going to be enormous. I don't think there's any way around that. Now, I talked about the waste generation of this process. And in fact, the different waste streams that have been generated in the U.S. are by and large not being dealt with. So the spent, the salt, where a lot of the fission products and the plutonium have ended up, 
um, was supposed to be turned into a ceramic waste form that would be suitable for a geologic repository. That never happened. So they're just, they're stuck with that salt. It's still sitting in the facility. Uh, it's been there for 25 years and they don't have a plan. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, it's a uh, molten salt with uh, a lot of plutonium fission products in it, uh, uh, chemically uh, you know, reactive, can't be disposed of directly and they don't know what to do with it. And in addition, there's all the leftover uranium. And one of the uh, features of pyroprocessing is that it doesn't separate anything very well. So that uranium actually is contaminated with enough plutonium and other fission products. So it's really not clean at all. And um, it would have been uh, a, a just a, a massive waste problem, except that uh, one company had the bright idea of actually uh, trying to use it in a fast reactor that they want to build at Idaho National Laboratory. That's a whole other story, but it will still have to be cleaned up in order to do that. And that'll cost a lot of money. So the power processing didn't work for a lot of reasons, but it's a very labor intensive operation. It has to be done remotely. The manipulators you use to uh, operate the process kept breaking down. It's very hard to do maintenance on this kind of facility. Now, uh, to talk about the um, proliferation issues. So, uh, Moltex again has maintained that uh, pyroprocessing doesn't increase the risk of nuclear proliferation because it doesn't produce separated plutonium. Uh, but again, this was something that U.S. nuclear weapons labs addressed more than 10 years ago. And I would just direct you to the statement uh, that advanced reprocessing approaches were, which produce group products in which plutonium is not separated from one or more minor actinides, that does not render the product unattractive for use in a nuclear weapon. And even if certain fission products are also carried over with that plutonium, as in, is the case for Multex, that wouldn't change the conclusion in pretty technical slide. This comes from the paper I just quoted. The important thing to notice here is anything in the pink area, any fuel composition in this pink area is, is attractive for weapons use. And so I plotted where I think the Multex fuel would actually be. And it's clearly in this pink area. Uh, because the, the burn up of the can do fuel is fairly low. And based on this composition, uh, Multex is in the pink area and it's weapons usable. IA safeguards are uh, an important consideration, especially because there's going to be reprocessing and separation of plutonium. But there really is no technical approach right now for meeting the IAE's verification goals. And that could be a problem uh, for Canada uh, if it wants to start up that facility without getting, uh, uh, without having, without the IEA having a, an accepted and effective safeguards approach in, in place. So in conclusion, um, the, the process has not been demonstrated to be reliable. Uh, certainly at the scale that would be required, some like a thousand times the maximum demonstrated rate in the United States just to produce that first core. Um, there are other fact, other aspects of the process that haven't been demonstrated either. It generates multiple radioactive waste streams that don't have well-defined disposition paths, it increases nuclear proliferation terrorism, and there are still engineering challenges um, uh, in every aspect of the process. So um, I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, lots of material to process there. 